Hey guys, got a fantastic show for you today. I'm talking with Michael Gelb. Michael is the world's leading authority in the application of genius thinking. Basically, he helps people discover and use their creative genius. He's written 17 books. One of them is called Body Learning, an introduction to the Alexander Technique. This book made a big difference in my life many years ago. And he's written another book called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. Anyway, guys, you are going to love this conversation. We talk about everything from the Alexander Technique to Superman to Leonardo da Vinci to Qigong to Tai Chi to Aikido and how to absorb force when somebody pushes you. Anyway, super fun conversation and you are going to love it or else. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So, Michael, I first learned about you back in 2009 um, when I read Body Learning. Um, your introduction to the Alexander technique and that was the first time well so my whole life my parents would say don't slouch stand up straight um and I was in the I, I was a I was a personal trainer and I was a firefighter at the time and you know I would also go to these uh exercise corrective exercise courses and things like that and they'd be like no you need to stand this way hold your shoulders back keep your head this certain way and stuff and I just it, it just never clicked or I just couldn't do it um and I, I found out later it's because I was trying to hold something instead of let something move through me I guess but when I read your book it was the first time that it ever clicked with how to hold my head <laughs> or or just how to kind of carry myself on um, from from day to day uh so thank you for that my pleasure <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget it, like it. uh say what that's why I wrote it Precisely yes. for that reason, to help someone exactly like you in just that sort of circumstance. And I was in a, a I, I knew I knew when it clicked because I was driving the fire truck one day and my captain looked over at me and said, you know, Tim, you can sit back in the seat. And but I was sitting upright and I was I had to adjust all the mirrors and everything. And I was just very, you know, just sitting very tall, like, no, I think I'm OK. That's because <laughs> cool. I felt good. I felt good at the time. That's great. So can you, is it, is it possible for you to explain what the, what the Alexander technique is? I mean, cause it's not just about posture. That's just something that resonated with me. Sure. Well, that's why I wrote the book. That was my explanation because when I was trying to find out what, what this was, it was, it was difficult to get a clear explanation. And I realized that the explanation depends on what the person is seeking. So some people are just in pain and frequently pain is a function of the way we're moving, the way we're carrying ourselves, holding ourselves, especially patterns of use of the self over time, patterns of the way we carry ourselves, hold ourselves over time that are just slightly out of balance can cause or exacerbate many other problems. So a lot of bad backs and stiff necks. It doesn't mean that this way we carry ourselves is the sole cause or problem that a particular person is having, but it's almost always a factor. And as the years go by, it becomes more of a factor. John Dewey, the great American philosopher, spoke of compensatory maladjustments. So in other words, you injure your knee playing soccer or something. And as a result of injuring your knee, you favor the other leg. You take weight off the injured leg and that throws off your gait a little bit. And then your right shoulder twists forward and you stiffen your neck a little bit to compensate. And this happens at first in a very subtle way. A lot of times people are absolutely unaware of it. But that pattern of discoordination becomes a habit. And then it causes problems by itself, even after the knee, it's the original injury is, is fully healed. So the Alexander work is a brilliant, genius way for becoming aware of and freeing ourselves from those compensatory maladjustments. But it's so much more than that because it's also an extraordinary method for developing stage presence and performance skill. 
because it turns out that the way you move and stand and comport yourself makes a dramatic difference if you are an actor or if you are a singer or a musician or if you're a CEO who has to get up in front of a large group of people. That the ability to present yourself, which was the title of the second book I wrote <laughs> many, many years ago, the ability to present yourself, the ability to be present, to be aligned and poised on stage in front of others has a direct effect on the way you're perceived and on the way you feel. If you're poised, you feel more at ease and it's easier to act that scene, play that song, dance that particular bit of choreography or sing that aria. And it's not just that you feel better and you look better, but for example, if you're a singer or a musician, you sound much better. That was one of the things that shocked me when I first went to the Alexander training, because my the two heads of my Alexander training course were both professional musicians. And one of the fellows on the course was a top violinist. He still is many years later, a brilliant guy named Bill Benham. And Bill was playing a, a piece on the violin. And I certainly had no clue about classical music back in those days, but it sounded pretty good to me. And then Paul Collins and Betty Rhino, my two teachers, put their hands on Bill and just help him refine his poise a little bit. And the sound, the change in the sound was immediate and such an improvement that a completely untutored person in classical music could hear the difference. It was just the difference between drinking a decent wine and a great wine. So, wow, what happened to this wine? And it was just from the subtlest changes they helped him, him make. So the Alexander technique is a profoundly useful method for improving stage presence and skill in performance. But then there's another answer. <laughs> and the other answer is that, because when I, when I first began training as an Alexander technique teacher, I wasn't in pain. I was really young and I had no, no pain to speak of, I really great shape. And I wasn't involved in performance. I wasn't artistic and wasn't giving speeches back in those days. I was just 20 years old, but I was really interested in self-knowledge. I was really interested in being more aware. I saw that I had patterns, habits of thinking, moving, and feeling that were not what I, I just wasn't the person I wanted to be. There was a gap between what I wanted to be and the way I was thinking, the way I was moving, and the way I was feeling. And more than anything I'd ever discovered, the Alexander work helped me become aware of those unconscious patterns. So as a means of developing self-knowledge of just pure self-observation, it was also the most extraordinary methodology I, I'd come across. And, and it was that that led me to want to become an Alexander Technique teacher. So that's some of what the Alexander Technique is. <laughs> uh, that, that, was, that was great, that was awesome. So if with the Alexander Technique, um, how did that like because right now you're a creative genius and, and you teach you teach people all over the world how to unlock their creativity would you say that learning how to to carry yourself or learning the alexander technique did that help you develop your creativity well first of all thank you for that compliment and i would say i don't consider myself a creative genius in any particular subject but what i have learned is how to let the natural genius that's available to all of us flow through and then to help people translate it into whatever area they wanna translate it that might be most useful to them. Whether that's uh, business or writing their first book. So I've developed, it's true, I've developed this passion for helping people understand and express their, their creativity. And the answer to your question is yes, the Alexander Technique well, it helped me in, in two ways. One was, it is a method for getting out of your own way, which is the secret of creativity. <laughs> it is a method for 
learning to listen more subtly and in a very down to earth practical way, when I was in the Alexander Technique training course in 1975, one of the students who would come for private lessons with one of my teachers was a gentleman named Tony Buzan who invented mind mapping and all sorts of other methodologies for creative thinking. And Tony at one point had released a book that was very popular and done a TV show on the BBC that was, I believe at the time, the number one rated educational program in British television. It's called Use Your Head. And he gave a talk about this at our Alexander School. And I thought this was genius. And I went up to the head of the school and I said, that guy's a genius, I wanna learn more from him. And the head of the school said, well, it's funny you say that because Tony said to me, who's that young American asking all those questions? I want, I want to get to know him. So I connected with Tony and I taught him how to juggle because at the time I was working my way through Alexander training as a professional juggler. And later I became his martial arts teacher and he taught me mind mapping and memory development and speed reading and accelerated learning. And we started working together, traveling around the world, teaching these seminars so I got to learn directly from one of the pioneers in the field of teaching people to think creatively because of his interest in the Alexander technique. And that's more than just a coincidence that he was interested in the technique as well. Right on. Yeah, no, that sounds like there was much a flow was happening. <laughs> so, and, and you mentioned that genius is available to all of us. Um, and I, I also heard you on a podcast say that ease and energy is is our birthright um so would ease and energy and genius be our birthright and if so how like is is the alexander technique a way for us to cultivate that and walk around in it daily yes to everything you just said <laughs> oh. well, that's easy yeah yes <laughs> it is uh, and i mean look at little Children, they're completely engaged, but there's just no unnecessary effort. They walk around with buoyancy and playful ease and delight in whatever it is they're exploring. They're wildly curious. They, you talk about, how do I hold my head? They have these big heads and these tiny bodies, but they keep them perfectly poised and they're exploring, they're seeing, they're tasting, they're touching, they're open to the environment, driven by our, our birthright of curiosity, which happens to be the first principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. And they're having fun, they're, they're playing, and they're learning at an amazing pace. So, you know, I say to the grown-ups that I teach, would you like to have more energy? And they all say, yes. Say, well, babies probably have the most energy. And the reason is they have the most curiosity, the wildest imagination. And they completely engage with life. So lest you become as little children, the kingdom of heaven will still be waiting for you. So get with the program. <laughs> love it uh, all right so so right there that brings me to my next question and it's not what you said but what you did uh, i have I've, I've listened to you on some podcasts and i've watched you on some videos and you have a very rich genuine deep laughter and it is it's just like i love hearing you laugh and i'm like this guy because it's, it's it sounds purely joyful so how do you how do you cultivate your joy? And where does your joy come from? God, I mean, really, it's not me. It's just, it's a gift that's accessible, I believe, to all of us. I like to have fun. I, I love, I'm having fun talking to you. It's fun to talk about this. And 
the thought that maybe it'll inspire somebody. I'm thrilled that it inspired you. So to me, that that is, I get my greatest sense of joy from the the opportunity to inspire other people to pass on some of these valuable lessons that I've learned. And one of them is the importance of humor in everyday life. So last night before, I pointed that way because that's where the bed is. <laughs> that's my bedroom. Last night, uh, before I went to sleep, I was listening to some Jim Gaffigan, completely silly, totally funny. And if I can, I like to go to sleep laughing. And I have to say that it, in the course of my life, there have been some very, very difficult times, just like anybody else's life. But I'd say that sense of humor and the ability to laugh at the situation, laugh at myself, has been one of the more fundamental essences that has gotten me through the most difficult times. And then is, so the joy is possible even in, in very difficult times. When you're laughing, you're happy. If you're a genuine laugh, doesn't matter what's going on, you're, it's, you're just happy. And if you can make other people laugh, it, it changes their state dramatically. And then they're, by the way, then they're more open to learning and they're more accessible to creativity. So I have a thesis that the ha-ha and the aha are first cousins. So wow. when you laugh, you're opening yourself to the creative mind and the creative mind is more open to laughter. That was, we stopped right there. That was amazing. <laughs> that was awesome. So uh, I, to my knowledge, we have a couple of things in com common, probably more, but I have this little YouTube channel where I, I teach people how to roll around and do childlike things on the floor like a child would and I have this principle that I'm always making fun of it feels good to feel good and I heard you on a, on a, a podcast say that you only engage in things that feel really good and I was like yes <laughs> if I can help it I, I mean that has been my my career strategy is to is to do things that I love that are fun that help people those are my my criteria and if it doesn't help people I'm not interested in doing it if it doesn't help me, if it's not fun, I really don't want to do it. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have to do my taxes and my accounting and you know the kinds of drudgery things that you have to do to be a responsible grown-up in this world. But whenever I can, I just find a good person and pay them to do it. <laughs> and hopefully they're happy doing it and it feels good oh, to do it. They love it. <laughs> my account loves it. He loves it. He, that's his, his bliss to, you know, to quote Joseph Campbell is figuring out how to file tax returns and getting them done on time. And then I make him laugh when we talk. So, and I try not to cry when he sends me his bill. I understand. The, the, the other thing I, I think we have in common is you like, well, you have two heroes that I, I like or um, Superman. Yes. And, and Leonardo da Vinci. Yes, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> so first one, why do you like Superman? Well, I like Superman. I mean, when, when I was a kid, the Superman comics were probably at their height of popularity. It was, it was before Spider-Man, there was Superman, and then there was Batman, as I recall. And then the, all the other ones came, but Superman, and there was a TV show of Superman. And the Superman is the archetype of the hero and of benign power. And when you're a child, especially, you're not aware of having any power. You're little, everybody else is big. So there's something natural in us to, to project our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations to, to this heroic being who has no constraints. He can fly, he can walk through walls, he can bend steel with his bare hands, he's faster than a speeding bullet, 
more powerful than the locomotive, <laughs> able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I mean, who wouldn't want to be able to do that? Uh, I still would like to be able to do it. Yes. But when you're a kid, the, the, the boundary between reality and the world of fantasy and imagination is very uh, slim, very permeable. So you project those desires and hopes onto a, a character, Superman being the classic. Right? And of course, when I got older, I realized he was just a comic book character, but I'd also learned my, my grandmother, Rosa, was her family was from Italy. She was a painter, very artistic. And she taught me about Leonardo da Vinci when I was young. And he seemed like somebody with these amazing powers. But as I got older, I realized he was real. He wasn't just a comic book character. So that's part of what inspired me to study Leonardo and ultimately write how to think like Leonardo da Vinci and other books about the maestro. Very cool. Yeah, I, I think as far as a real person goes, Leonardo was simply amazing um, because he had no limitations and there was just nothing he could not do in any field uh, or arena. And the more you learn about him, the more amazing he, he becomes. And, and, and this is weird. I, and this is completely weird. <laughs> but I was sitting at the before I, uh, I left the fire department to pursue a career in fitness and I was sitting in the fire station one night and I was contemplating on, on a book I was trying to write and I was just struggling with the idea or I just had this question in my head, what is the, the, the center, what is the, the way to get strong, like the secret of strength? Yeah. And um, I'm just sitting there uh, in the dorm room and that, that, the, the Humana drawing, that uh, the Leonardo da Vinci drawing popped into my head. And I was like, I mean, it was just random to me. Um, so, but I went into, uh, so I got up and went and found a computer and I, I, I found that drawing on the internet and then I printed it out and, and I drew a, a line. I was just looking at it and I drew a line from the, the square uh, of the, where he's got the, the man's inside of the circle and the square. And I drew a line from the corners of the squares and where they intersected was in the navel of, of that, that the man. And I'm like, and then that was like X marks the spot. That was a secret of strength. It like, like, it, I know it's weird, but, but to me, that was, that was the, that was the answer to my question was a secret of strength is the center. And anyway, I've done so much with that since then, but it was because of that drawing that popped into my head. That, that's utterly brilliant of you because that is the secret. And that is what Leonardo's aiming to show us in the Vitruvian man drawing and when one studies Aikido or Taiji or any art of self-defense, martial arts, the first thing you learn is that all your power comes from your center. And then the question is how to be centered. And the beauty of it is yeah, that's a really important thing to know if you're in a martial contest where somebody's trying to, if, you know, it could even be sumo wrestling where somebody's trying to push you out of the ring and you're trying to push them out of the ring or toss them onto the ground or they toss you onto the ground or regular re wrestling or boxing or mixed martial arts or whatever, power comes from the center. And it's not theoretical, you either have it or you don't, <laughs> and you'll find out very quickly. That's in, ta in Taiji, we do a practice called push hands, where you stand next to your partner and you, you don't punch each other, or kick each other, you just put hands on. Usually it's limited to the torso and the, the goal is to unbalance the other person without getting unbalanced yourself. And it's a really fun game to test how free and flexible and centered you are. And it's, you know, you can, you can't fake it because the other person, if they're more centered than you, you will not be able to move them and they will move you and vice versa. So 
you could you do the exercises and the practices for cultivating your center and then you can measure your progress by seeing gee am i better at not getting pushed out of the ring or can i push the other person and you know when i started studying aikido and then taiji and interacting with other people who were more experienced than me i was frequently able to certainly hold my ground and in many cases i had to try to be polite and not throw other people around uh, dismissively especially when they were senior to me because it's considered bad bad manners especially in, in aikido because it's it's japanese and more formal in taiji it's more it's like you got what you got and that's it there's there's uh, but either way there's still uh, uh, one wants to be sensitive to other people's sense of ego and pride even in a discipline that's not supposed to be about egotism and pride and one also has to make sure that one's own egotism and pride doesn't come into being able to toss other people around uh, but the reason i was able to be more skilled than i should have been in either of those disciplines was because i've been doing the alexander technique for years and years and years before i, I started either of them so i had a head start so to speak because in essence what aikido and taiji are is not disturbing the central axis under pressure so it's easy you know it's easy for us to to sit in a poised way or stand in a poised way and then it becomes a little harder if you're playing a violin or giving a keynote speech and it's a lot harder if somebody's trying to hit you in the head with a stick <laughs> which is why i love i love the martial arts because it's just okay you think you know something let's find out or some bigger person trying to just push you on your rear end and i you know i love that if, if they I, I i i have to say i especially love it when somebody bigger than me younger than me and stronger than me can't move me and it's not because it's me it's not that i it is it's what we talked about before it's these universal principles if you if you align with these principles they might as well be pushing on the earth and the more they push on me the more i'm giving them their energy back and they you know it's so it's i got to tell you it's it's still really fun plus it's even more fun as i get older and older because i'm really not supposed to be able to you know push you around if you're half my age and much stronger than me <laughs> but it's fun i confess to a certain extra delight in that <laughs> but that's okay because it feels good to feel good it feels good to feel good and i also i also i always attempt to sh share that in a way that's empowering to whoever i'm playing with so what i love to do is show anybody else how they can they can do that too that's what's great about it it's not it real it really isn't a thing that's special to a particular person. It's a universal gift. It's physics. You know, it's not even mystical. It's physics. It's leverage, but it's just having those principles of physics. And, and Leonardo would tell you the same thing. His anatomical drawings are some of the most precise anybody's ever done. And he was trying to figure out physics before there was physics. And we know about his amazing invention. So he understood vectors of force and how to how to have a structure that will stay up when various forces are put upon well it's the same thing with your body uh, so you get you 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 learn to be in a poised alignment and then you put various stresses on the system the stress could be give this speech sing this aria do push hands as a means of just studying, for me, it's a means of studying the principles and then helping other people learn and apply them to whatever is important to them. That's awesome. You know, the rest of the day, I'm going to be looking for somebody to push me and see how I, yeah. see how I fare. <laughs> right. Well, the, the, the real secret is it's to be centered, but it's not to resist the force. So when you're pushed, you yield. See, somebody pushes me here, but what they don't realize, like they hit me here, and if I'm just free, the, the push here creates 
the yin here creates the yang on the other side. And the danger is what happens if somebody pushes you back? Here, well, you better not do that because you just forgot your Alexander technique, right? So when they push you here, you need to sink. You need to sink so that they huh. fall on you. Then they're leaning on you. Then you can give it back to them. So you have these demand, you have up and down. You have moving around the 360 around your central axis and you have forward and back. So you can yield back, you can turn to your limit and you can sink down. Now a really, really skilled person who's bigger than you can take you down, push you to the extreme uh, and move you back without unbalancing themselves. And then you lose. <laughs> but it takes a lot of skill if you know how to go all the way to your, the lowest you can go, the most you can turn, and the farthest back you can go. And when's the moment to shift from, it's just like we're coming up to the solstice. It's the extreme yin moment. Like each day, nature here on the East Coast is moving back. It's turning and it's sinking and it's sinking. And on December 21st, it starts coming the other way. And this is nature. This is, you know, this is why you, this is the secret of the universe. So Taiji, Aikido and the Alexander technique are ways of harmonizing with that secret of the universe in our own being. So the, the, the secret of the universe and, and what you were just saying is yielding. Well, it's, it's- And then returning. It's, yeah, there's a time to yield and there's a time to advance. And the wise person knows the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh -huh. is, it's, it's, it's timing it's being attuned to the timing in the moment as to what's what's called for and that's that's a lifetime discipline to to learn that with the challenges that life brings to us which are grave for for many of us and you know that's why this stuff is not just this, this is essential to the art of living as far as, as in my own experience. So as far as, as far as the art of living goes, okay, because wait, you, you, you're kind of like Leonardo da Vinci. You teach the Alexander technique, meditation, juggling, Aikido, Tai Chi, Qigong. You probably teach something else I have no idea about or lots of things. Like how, how that's, a, that's amazing. Um, so what is, what is a day in the life of Michael Gelb look like like how do you practice this art of living like to so full as fully as you do <laughs> there I, the funny thing is i don't know if i have a a typical day i mean there's some, there are some practices that i do every day and uh, i do now i do my qigong practice every day uh, I do my Tai Chi form every day. I do prayer and meditation every day. Uh, whenever the weather allows, I go for a walk in nature every day. I listen to beautiful music every day. I surround myself with as much beauty as I, as I can with art and I mean, I have aromatherapy going in my office, just like Leonardo did in his studio. <laughs> I have a picture of Leonardo's Vitruvian man over there in my office. So it helps me remember uh, to be centered. And I drink the best wine I can every day. I eat the best food. And I try to be as kind to everybody as I can possibly be and look for opportunities to help others and then you know, I, I might, I work, I do executive coaching. So I'm working with clients one-to-one -one on, on Zoom for usually an hour at a time. And then over the years, I've, I've traveled around the world giving keynotes and seminars. Obviously, I haven't been doing that in the last two years, but it's just been starting to open up again. I'm doing it 
I haven't flown yet, but I've done a lot of live events in the greater New York area, uh, which I'm loving. It's great. It's great to be back with in the same room with real, real people. So that's nice. That's what I, you know, that's, I guess that's a day I play with my dog. And, and most importantly, I get to enjoy being with my, my wife. And so I'll just, I'll tell you the best thing that ever happened from writing body learning. Cause when I was writing it, when I was working on my master's thesis, it started as my master's thesis while I was taking the Alexander training. I was writing my master's thesis and attempting to describe the Alexander technique. And at that time, Deborah was three years old. And she turned out to be one of those kids who's gifted in singing. She always got the solo in the choir and she wound up getting a master's degree at Manhattan School of Music and then getting a scholarship to go to Juilliard for three years in their professional opera program. So she got paid to go to Juilliard. And when she was at Juilliard, they teach the Alexander Technique as part of the curriculum there. So her teacher gave her a copy of Body Learning. And she saw at the back of Body Learning that there was a seminar that I recommended out in California. We do it every year. This year, we're going to do it online. It's uh, the Malibu Alexander Technique Seminar in, in December. And so she came out to that seminar. And that's where we met 17 years ago. And we've been together ever since. <laughs> so I, writing the book had a benefit that I never could have even imagined. And so the other, you know, the other thing that is, is the, no, by far the greatest blessing in my life is my marriage uh, to Deborah. So I, I, something that it just would be complete to say, what do I do every day? Because part of what I do is whatever Deborah wants me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the secret of happiness right, right there <laughs> i take out the garbage with perfect poise <laughs> so literally the alexander technique kind of just brought you almost everything or you have found joy through the alexander technique in everything it's 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 one of the greatest greatest blessings of my life i do you know a lot of times a great exercise for all of us to do is write down the things you're grateful for uh, and then feel the feeling of, of gratitude and finding the Alexander technique and, not, and also finding wonderful Paul Collins and Betty Reina, Peggy Williams, uh, Walter Carrington. These were some of the people who uh, were very generous to me when I was a student of the on the training course and then a, a new a new teacher. So, but I, and I also, I feel a, a gratitude to Alexander himself because the guy was an amazing genius. And it's fashionable, you know, to, to criticize heroes and find all these flaws and faults and things, blah, blah, blah. And yes, he was part of the, you know, Victorian age and he had a way of speaking and writing that certainly don't fit with our ethos today and how we think about social justice and so on, uh, which is not to excuse all of that, but uh, it's kind of absurd to denigrate him and, and try to throw out the baby with the bathwater as some people are doing with Thomas Jefferson and other great people who are heroes despite their flaws. And this is the other thing too is, I haven't come across anyone, including Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who doesn't have flaws, who didn't make mistakes. Uh, and we, know we, have this, we have this false idea of perfection that it means to be completely error-free, to be free of mistakes and failure. And, and, and it's absurd because life isn't like that. The secret for us as Alexander students is uh, how do we learn from them, make sure we don't repeat them and if you're really smart, you learn from the mistakes of others. That could be helpful. Yeah. And less painful sometimes. Yeah.
so maybe then the the perfect the the flaws are the perfection then. Well, it's just interesting in in so many of the different traditional forms of art in the world, whether it's Navajo rug weaving or Japanese Zen pottery casting, there's always a flaw in the rug or in the pot. And that's part of its beauty. And because we, we just, we have this sterile, absurd idea of trying to be perfect and it doesn't work because what, the more, what happens is people suppress their shadow, they suppress their unconscious. And it's, it's, this is not easy work for any of us, but to, life will bring it to the fore. Where is your unconsciousness? How can you bring light to it? How can you change habitual patterns that may not be serving you or serving others? And that continues through your whole life. And Alexander provides a somatic component, you know, a way of just being more aware of what's going on with you. To know yourself is to know that something happens, you have a thought, and can you feel the tiny little surge of cortisol that's shooting you? <laughs> and then, and what does that do to you? To your, to your neck. You know, what I learned recently is, like we talk about the startle pattern and the way, you know, Frank Pierce Jones did a classic study where he startled people, people and found that they, they did this and we're all familiar with that. And we know that a lot of people walk around like this as a habitual way of being. But what I've learned is that the startle pattern begins even faster than Frank Jones was able, able to measure. It begins with, because uh, it's starting, it's, and it's starting pre-consciously in the brainstem and it's manifesting right away in the face and the jaw before it even gets to the retroflexion of the head. It's, there's already this clamp that's coming on. And most people where I was totally unaware of it until I worked with somebody who was really gifted at helping me, helping people figure that out, see what's going on. Because I was noticing that despite 40 years of Alexander work and therapy and all this stuff, there were still patterns of, of stress and tension and fear that, which, you know, some of which were brought up during the difficulty of the last couple of years. And I said, can't believe that this is still going on with all of this work. Uh, but yes, it is. And so my, my, I was, but I feel like, again, all my Alexander work helped me be able to be receptive to what this particular friend was teaching me. And it's just, wow. And it's humbling. You know, it's one of my, one of my personal mottos is if you're not humble, you're not paying attention. Mm. All right. So with that awareness though, what do you do? Like with all that, the 40 years of training and now you're aware that there's still these habits that are somewhere in there, what do you do? Well, the great news is what I learned uh, working with this particular gentleman is there's nothing you can do because it already happened, except be aware. And then when you be aware and you feel it, you become aware of it with your kinesthetic sense, which my Alexander work has made pretty keen. Just the awareness grants a certain freedom. Mm -hmm. Because what happens with, uh, uh, I've been studying a lot about trauma because I feel like not only have I experienced it, but trauma has gone beyond just, okay, you lived through the war, uh, you were a firefighter in a burning building and one of your colleagues died or you couldn't rescue somebody. so. Uh, and, and not just the trauma of people who grow up in, in obviously terrible places with rampant violence and so on, but there, this, this is an era where there's, there's mass trauma in first world countries. 
from people's lives as they understood them being so disrupted. Right. And the thing about trauma is, you know something's a trauma when something happens and it triggers a response that's disproportionate to the threat at the moment. So when somebody gets really upset and very disturbed because of a thing that seems like a, a small thing. So it's, you know, it, and it's, it's the, well, anyway, without giving a whole discourse on it, the point is it's a stimulus and a response. And even though the fear response happens so fast that you may not be able to interpose the delay between the stimulus, the trigger and your response because it already happened, there's still then, then that the fact that it happened, the fact that you feel or become aware of this withdrawal of <clears throat> the muscles in your face, this tightening and the tightening of the jaw and the tightening of these muscles here and the little interference with your breath. By becoming aware of it, you can free it from association with whatever it is that's being triggered. So in other words, you say, this is what's happening now. You, it's, you can be more resourceful in the present rather than the waves of sometimes very disturbing feelings that can rise up when, when, when we get triggered. So I, I don't feel like the Alexander technique by itself is the preferred methodology to deal with, with trauma. There's the, the wonderful work of the Bessel van der Kolk and uh, Peter Levine and a lot of other brilliant folks who are, who are going deep into, into this uh, and have done for many, many years. But the Alexander Technique has something to contribute as well in terms of helping us be more attuned to those kinesthetic messages and more aware and more aware of being aware. Because I, I do feel like that awareness in the moment makes a, a huge positive difference. Does, with that awareness coupled with, like after you're aware, you have to, there's a, you, if you are aware, you can make a decision. Yes. Yeah. And then, so your decision could be to smile or to relax or to let go or. Well, even before you make those decisions, which are decisions that we often do to attempt to, to shift it or change it. You said before something like, it's, it's, it's good to feel good about feeling good. Mm -hmm. uh, another profound thing I've learned is uh, you don't have to feel bad about feeling bad. Okay, I like that. So, because if we think we always have to feel good, then we feel really bad for feeling bad. You know, I'm an Alexander teacher. I wrote the book. I, so I should always feel good. I should always be smiling and laughing and ah, ha, ha. Well, guess what? That's not so. I, I have times of struggle and times of grave pain. And so for me, it was a breakthrough lesson to let that be okay. Because it was different. It, it didn't fit with my self-image. Uh, that, that's powerful. That's powerful. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. If, if someone wants, you, you, you have online curriculum, you, you teach people how to be creative, how to let out their genius. You teach the Alexander technique. If, if someone wanted to learn from you, where, where's the best place they should go? Thanks for asking. The best place is michaelgelb.com. That's G E L B michaelgelb.com. And we have all sorts of really Cool free stuff there, free videos and articles. Uh, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, we'll let you know when I'm doing various, I'm teaching on the Alexander Technique Malibu online course starting December 28th, which is a fabulous course we've been teaching together for over 40 years. And we did it online last year. It was great. We're gonna do it online this year. We hope to be back to live next year. And I've also created a immersive online 
video course in how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. And there's free previews of that available at michaelgeld.com. And if I'm not mistaken, can people go there if they want to and even train with you on the weekends on Saturdays? Is that oh, right. thing? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I hope to start that up again in the spring. We had our Saturday uh, training courses in uh, various, uh, I call it body learning, life energy genius. And it's, I'm teaching a synthesis of the Alexander Technique, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, Aikido, Meditation. Uh, it's some original methodologies as well as some traditional forms that I've learned from great masters. And we hope to start those up again. I have another website called lifeenergygenius.com. And I, we have some free courses there you can take and a few that you can purchase if you want to go deep into some of the forms that I've created. That sounds awesome. More stuff too. But Michael Gelb is the clear. If you come to michaelgelb.com, then we'll send you info about everything else. Right on. Michael, thank you. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Great to, great to speak with you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.